Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash oxum, join the YouTube channel directly, or go to oxum.substack.com. Our guest today is my brother. He's a repeat guest, Yosias Samson. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. I got banned my good and I used to in Dana, we're good. Um, so one of the things that I have done a couple of times, if not a few times, actually, uh, actually one time recently on the program is trying to look at the lives of those who have recently reposed, especially those who recently repose in the Lord. Um, most recently did John McAfee, who was not a believer, but before that did uh, Professor Gitacho Haile, who was the world's leading um, scholar. And I'd have to go through all my videos to see what that uh, is like. And in those two other cases, I had relied on people who had a far more intimate knowledge of those people than I did and try to see what there is to glean as a, you know, disclaimer for everyone, you know, including you and the whole audience. Like, um, I, I want to, in a sense, memorialize uh, Pastor Tim Keller and their, you know, the obvious disclaimer is that he uh, is a Calvinist. I am not. Uh, he seems to have been a, a huge player in the Presbyterian Christian community. I'm in the, what's called Oriental Orthodox by many people, what I usually use in my own language afro-asiatic orthodox or simply just say ethiopian orthodox to to tell people so that that background is there and there are going to be some differences because of that but i think there are things to be gleaned especially from people who have um, been in their walk for really long periods of time so i think it'd be a good place to start just if you could um, I, I don't know how, I want to make it independent of our first episode. I don't know how much we discussed it the first time you were on, but did you discuss what exactly is your, um, Christian background and where, where that would overlap or where it wouldn't overlap, um, with, um, Tim Keller? Yeah. Um, okay. Interesting question. So I'd say, well, first, yes. I am a believer, a Christian. Um, I love the Lord. He has been uh, such an important and integral part of my life. Um, quick synopsis would be uh, my parents uh, raised me going to church. So it was uh, sort of in our household early on. Uh, didn't miss church for anything. <laughs> but it was probably around uh, 16 or so where I really... Uh, took ownership of my faith, I would say. Like before that I was, you know, knew the stories, did like the whole thing. Um, but it was at a, the first time I went to church camp uh, was the summer before my junior year of high school. And that experience really um, encouraged me and inspired me to pursue more of the things of God. I think one of the things that really spoke to me was I'd never been around people my age worshiping. And that's sort of weird to say growing up and going to church, yeah. you know, my whole life, it, it always felt sort of like the adults thing, like, Oh, they do that, whatever. Um, but at that camp, I was really impacted by seeing people who were my age within, you know, plus or minus a couple of years, right. It was a uh, middle school, high school, early college camp. Um, just like, really going after it just you know praying singing like i was like oh i mean i say i'm a christian and i don't have what they have like i'm not passionate enough about my faith to like go up to the front and do those things so like that's interesting like where where's what else is there it intrigued me um and that just began a journey that is still going on today still still trying to get to know jesus more and more um but that i guess is a quick synopsis um sorry i forgot your, the it's okay i i can help that's what i'm here yeah that's why i'm here i'm the sherpa um so 
the the ages thing you said i can relate to actually i was serving for a long time at the parish i was baptized at um the virgin mary's parish in los angeles and now i'm serving at a saint tukla parish in riverside and one of the stark differences is that um um there are maybe two to four people in their 20s and 30s everyone else is like high school and below or old like minimum 40s 50s and, mm -hmm. and maybe older not we don't have too many people older than that to be honest but like i would say a huge chunk of the church is in their 40s and 50s and even at the parish i grew up at there were i would say seasons where a good amount of people in their 20s and 30s professionals were there but like i think for example the whole you know everything that happened with the the lockdowns and covid there it was it was devastating to i think people's what i describe as their comfort level of not attending church especially the idea of two things one the uh, youtube broadcast of the worship service of the liturgy in our case as well as i myself led a bible study online and i had to make a tough decision in that regard too which was um at one point i decided it's been enough we've taken enough precautions i think it was like a year and a half we'd gone through like all of acts like 12 chapters of luke and i think all of galatians and i was like it's been plenty of weeks you know uh it's time whether i lose all these people or not and i had about seven to 30 people different times during the pandemic regularly showing up every week to study the word from their home on the laptop but at a certain point i had to um make the decision to stop that to invite people to come back in person and i think for a good three to four or five months i like lost everybody like nobody came and then and then i think people started uh coming like one or two people and then we got some semblance of a program um again but I think there were just seasons where it was young, really young kids and then really old people and nobody um, in between. But the main, I guess, um, question I wanted to ask you was I was just giving a, a disclaimer about the kind of denominational difference. Um, That's right. I, I understand as a, as a kid growing up, you would have no sort of awareness of that. I guess uh, maybe beginning when you were at, at 16, maybe not. I don't know how diverse the church camp was or the backgrounds of the people. I'm assuming it was some people, uh, I think, at least tangentially related to different charismatic movements. I had a blog post recently, for example, in the church calendar of the Orthodox Church. It was a holiday called Pentecost this Sunday, which is, of course, the descent or the coming down of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. Uh, get the flaming tongues and they preach Christ crucified and resurrected in all of the languages as we find it in um, Acts chapter two. And people get that holiday confused. And I even had some people like reply to my email and comment telling me that they saw some Orthodox uh, mothers get startled when people wish, wish them a blessed Pentecost or happy Pentecost because they thought that they were being accused of being uh, a Pentecostal. <laughs> and I mentioned in that article that, that there are kind of, um, really three different ways of talking about that. Like I said, it's it's a, it's a first century word, the word Pentecost, and it means the 50th day after the resurrection of Christ. So it's like a holiday that also predated Christianity and Judaism um, and related to the, to the, to the Passover, but um, it, it got a new meaning as like the, the birthday of the church. And the other two meanings are strict and loose. The strict meaning is like the Pentecostal denomination that started on Azusa Street in 1906 in los angeles which is tied to various charismatic movements maybe the bethel church in um in uh sacramento california may be kind of the famous uh if not the most representative kind of exponent of that school but there are many different variations but i said people use it in a loose sense to kind of just speak about any protestant in ethiopia which i think is uh very like inaccurate because then you get churches like the lutheran church uh which have like very specific beliefs and i went to a lutheran middle school so i know them pretty well and um the seventh day adventist you know have a, a couple cousins and family friends who uh are in the seventh day adventist tradition as well in fact my my son was born in a, in a seventh day adventist hospital so uh you Shout know I have this <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, uh, so that so i wonder if like 
your teenage years were a time where you became aware at all of any denominational differences of Christianity. And if you were either in the kind of what what's called sometimes the they just call the themselves the reformed tradition or the Calvinist yeah. tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the tulip, you know, the acronym tulip. Um <laughs> I forget what it, uh, all of. I just remember the word depravity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or, or you, you know what I mean? Like, were you? Because were you in those circles uh, that would increasingly share Venn diagram space with Tim Keller, or were you just like was the only connection that you would both call yourselves Christian? Like, I'm trying to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like you said, growing up, we were Pente in the Abisha word, the loose characterization right meaning just sort of i think in general i grew up to believe that meant protestant like because it was just always used in conjunction with like as opposed to orthodox or catholic um but yeah i i still don't have a great idea of what denominations the abasha churches i grew up in are at because some of them i affiliate with baptist yeah. denominations in america uh some like you said have that lutheran background and some uh, would definitely be more charismatic and so would not necessarily fall into a Baptist or Luther. So, but I guess officially, because they don't belong to a denomination, it's sort of, sort of not meaningless, but let it's less strict because there's no oversight, right? Unlike um, yeah. an Orthodox church or a Catholic church. So the Lutherans um, do have some sort of yes, governing yes. bodies. If you had yes. been in those Lutherans. And one of the things I remember about the Lutherans is like they have some sort of formal, you know, written down liturgy that would be kind of commonplace. And they baptize babies. As I recall, the Baptists are kind of against baptizing babies. And yep. I think they may have some common worship songs, but I don't think they have something that would be called a liturgy. I'm willing to be corrected on on that regard. And then there's so, sort of like a a white Baptist, black Baptist difference. <laughs> so I don't know if, if the Habishas are hanging out with the white Baptists or the black Baptists or. I, I my experience has been that there's very little focus on things like that because, sorry, on, on things like the American side of it or the non Habisha side. It's just sort of like if you're. Abasha and your Pente, then you go to the Pente church. And if you're Orthodox, you go to the Orthodox church. And like the denominational differences that would have showed up if you were American or in a more high church context sort of get smoothed over, which is different. So when I was then now 16, you know, moving ahead, like pursuing faith on my own, um, I started going to an American church as well. So okay. like, um, I would attend an American church's youth group. That American church was non-denominational. And then I started seeing, oh, there are some differences here, right? There are things that people will have doctrinal stances on. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was actually introduced to Tim Keller through the pastor of that, denom uh, that non-denominational church. It was called Christ That's Community Church at the time. Now it's Mosaic Church Austin. Um, and he quoted Tim Keller regularly um okay. he was my pastor morgan very well read and um i noticed like oh this guy tim keller is brought up sort of regularly um and at one point i just had a conversation with uh pastor morgan about it i was like yeah you know i i'm uh hoping to be a youth leader one day like i want to learn how to preach well and you know what have you done to grow in that gift and one thing he recommended to me was Tim Keller taught a class. And that was, I think, one of my first big introductions to Tim Keller was, oh, okay. So he did this class with uh, Dr. Edmund Clowney called Preaching Christ in a Postmodern World. Um, and it's like a seminary class. It was like, it's just basically a seminary class. So it's just, uh, I think it's still on the internet in places, iTunes use where I uh, checked it out. But it was phenomenal. Like it opened my eyes. Like I, I know that Tim Keller's Presbyterian and I'm sure we have some differences based on his, you know, affiliations with different things, but I loved pretty much everything I've ever seen from Tim Keller. Okay. Um, I, I, we are cooking now and we are 
definitely in the right direction. I'm going to tell you that. And so I hope you enjoy this too. Um, if I'm mischaracterizing anything, you'll please correct me. But sure. I have swam in these circles before. And um, with my cursory knowledge of Tim Ker Keller, and especially of the larger Reformed Calvinist movement, which I know a lot better, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, like figures like James White and others who are like debating people and stuff like that. But no, I, no. I have, I have swam in these circles, especially having, you know, gone to, uh, for example, a Church of Christ denomination uh, college and, and just, just being around these. I've, I've seen this. My general kind of impression is that the more strict uh, kind of Azusa Pentecostal or the larger charismatic movements tend to emphasize emotion more. And it seems like the Tim Keller crew emphasize like the intellect and like precision in preaching more. And what I mean is the very first time I came across anything like the Azusa tradition was in undergrad. I was about 17, 18 years old and a fellow black American gentleman comes up to me and he says to me, have you received the gift of tongues? And when I responded with a little bit of uncertainty, he told me, and this was one of the kind of official doctrines that came out of like the Azusa Street community in the beginning. Like again, and again, they're like adjacent movements that don't necessarily sign on, but may have other agreements. And he told me, and this was a time where I was kind of just like nominally an Orthodox Christian, but I didn't have like a depth of knowledge. He told me that I did not have salvation unless I had the gift of tongues. And I didn't know a lot, but I knew that that could not be the case. And everything that I know, which is very cursory about Tim Keller, would be that he would not subscribe to something I, like I that and that that's that. where the tensions would be. But it seems like from the way you said it, you kind of swim in both of these circles too. And you seem like more tolerant of both sides. Is that is that a fair Yeah. So in college, um, I joined a college ministry. Shout out to uh, Kyle at Stanford. Changed my life. Um, so Kyle is part of the Assemblies of God um, yeah. denomination. So definitely on the charismatic side. Um, but I would not subscribe to that belief that if someone doesn't have the gifts of tongues that they're not saved. Um, and I don't believe that many people I went to group, group with Kyle Foot, all that stuff would not agree with that either. So I don't, like you said, there's adjacent movements and people believe different things and all that, you know, we can't speak for everyone, but exactly. um, so yes, you're also right that like, I have been a part of what some people might say are like, opposite ends of the spectrum um or at least further apart um but the way that i see it is you know wisdom can be found in many places and there are things that people miss or gloss over based on their tradition um and it's good to be well fed um and i have gleaned and learned a lot um i love chi alpha it has been like that time in college um really just supercharged and it, it was phenomenal and i still am close to many of my friends from there um and it's still blessing us like you know my wife uh who i who i met after college uh has met m many of my friends and it's just like wow like they're amazing i'm s like i wish i could have been a part of that um with you so that's been awesome um i so i after i got married i changed churches so me and my wife started going to a church together um so the church that i was going to from high school i started attending another church and now i attend a house church um and that house church is not non-denominational as well meaning like there's no other higher structure but um is so as a result is not like strictly tied to any of these specific things right but mm -hmm. um there are definitely elements of char charismatic stuff in it there's definitely elements of non-charismatic stuff and so i enjoy that i like i like that we are doing our best to follow what we believe the word says and we're open to okay god like speak to us help us 
understand your word, um, that we would follow you well. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. No, this is this is a great introduction. Thank you. So that makes yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, I saw you smiling slash giggling too when I said that because because people could say it's unfair to characterize as one emotional, one intellectual. But you're yeah. saying like yes, and you're saying like you would like both of those experience. Another way people could say it is like experiential versus thinking. Maybe that's a more polite way to uh, say it, right? Like faith by I'd experience. like that better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like, like faith by experience and oftentimes emphasizing spontaneity versus like faith through uh, systems, like systematic theology and, uh, you know, studying. Um, you know what and, I mean? Like, I think, yeah, for me, one of the criticisms I had of my parents' church growing up was it felt like we weren't um like there wasn't enough of a structure right to me um my opinion and i think that there's things that you miss with that um and so there's something nice about having more structure like but it's funny because in kyle which is also on the charismatic side there was this uh phrase that the worship team used structured spontaneity <laughs> there you and go it, it i was like oh you can do both like and they use that to mean like okay when they're leading uh the musical portion of worship right they, they have a few songs planned out they've practiced right and they're going to play through those songs but they intentionally will leave a portion of that time and say we are not going to necessarily sing in this moment, or we're going to free this up for if someone uh, feels like they're led to share a word, if someone feels like they're led to sort of lead spontaneously, like we have time for that. And we also are be like, and it's time for the sermon or it's time for, you know, like there's this idea of like, we can be led by the spirit. And at the same time, we still believe that God is a God of order and not of uh, confusion. And so <laughs> That I loved that. And then, you know, on the other side, there's, you know, the stereotype would be like, if you're too emotion or experiential based, I think the criticism is, you know, you lose your grounding in the word. And I love that there are people who are like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study. Like, this is the word of God, and like it is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it's gonna changed my life and i'm going to submit to what this says and my college pastor one of the most like well-rounded theological people that i know and just know scripture very well um and i love that and i think that's good um and at the same time you know go coming more now in my church now where a lot of people came out of uh like a baptist background and so definitely much more word heavy and like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if they're all, if they were all tulip, but some of the churches they came from were more of the strict Calvinist side. Um, but they're seeing, oh yeah, like we do need to study the text. Like the point, like <laughs> it, it's, I, I guess one just gross mischaracterization would be like, you know, one side would rather skip the sermon it's like yeah. cut something out, they'd skip yes. the sermon and the other side would be like, we will skip the musical portion of worship. Yeah. But I've seen people on both sides in the different camps, right? Um, and there is something important, like God is not limited to our understanding or our ways of engaging with him. And so there, there are going to be things that we will learn and experience in musical worship that we might not just from the word and vice versa. And along with time we would spend just in prayer. Like that's another thing that I think is cool is when churches make space to pray. Um, we're not going to have like this fancy program or whatever. Like we're just going to take time and we're going to pray for one another. Like think, anyways, I'm going on and on, but um, no, no, it's beautiful. And I'm going to tell you, like, you may be surprised to hear that, this so this same sort of dynamic which is happening within american protestantism happens even within for example the ethiopian orthodox church is that um 
it's not necessarily uh, spontaneity. Um, there, there is always what we call yehlinas alot, which is uh, the prayer of the inner heart or of the conscience, which is always you know freestyle. It's always free form. It's not written, um, but it almost always ends in the Lord prayer. Um, and but but this sort of uh, especially the way that you phrased how we could mischaracterize this experiential versus thinking this worship versus studying of the word at one extreme you could see some people who are so deep in the word that that's maybe the only thing that they do maybe they view that itself as their prayer which yeah. i think that especially if we're talking about the psalms of david and the lord's prayer which are both biblical there's definitely something to it but there is also room for those uh, kind of other like amorphous uh, freestyle ones, especially the ones that are specific to people's um, particular uh, situations. But but a similar dynamic I think happens, and um, I always kind of uh, related more to that more tulip thinking side. But I never I was never a Calvinist. Like yeah. within you know the Orthodox tradition or whatever tradition I was in, I was a person who always kind of leaned towards the word. Like I've seen people who literally teach not to pray the Lord's prayer and only to pray spontaneous prayers and would have like maybe an all nighter prayer session. You know what I mean? Where everything is just, uh, you know, like coming out of their own fountain, uh, springing forth from their own fountain. And on the other side, you know, uh, people who are so, uh, averse to spontaneous prayer that if you told them to pray on the spot, they literally could only say prayers that they have memorized. And I, I do think there needs to be a balance between the formal and the, yes. the the informal there. And I think it's something that's applicable to many people's situations. But to bring it back to Tim Keller, who I want to kind of uh, commemorate in a, in a sense um, via you and, and your greater knowledge of him, this class that you said is very fascinating to me. My uh, spiritual father, Father Thomas Finley, since 2012, since I've been engaging with him, has named kind of two big enemies in the world one was secular humanism and the other is postmodernism. so i'm delighted to hear you mention that tim keller did and i i learned a little bit about that in my western philosophy classes that were also of course at this christian university i went to could you uh tell me a little bit because we hear this word a lot um what is postmodernism? And then was this like a synchronous or asynchronous class you were taking? Asynchronous. Yeah. All the classes, the lectures were recorded. It's just sort of listen it, you know, at your own pace. There were no assignments or anything on the thing. Um, no discussion and, forums or anything either. So you're just kind of in taking it yourself or? Yeah, exactly. It's just completely self paced. Yeah. Um, it, it's more like, think of it like it was just a series of talks, right? Yeah. That he just talked okay. about. Okay. Um, so, yeah. It's, so, I mean, imagine, I imagine. The majority of people you engage with, if they're the same as mine, you say postmodernism, and they wouldn't necessarily know what that means. Uh, so, yeah, can you talk about what postmodernism is? Like you, how you how, how, how you understand it? This because I mean, it, it's been a while since I took that class, but yeah, it, in general, if you put me on the spot and ask me, "Hey, what is postmodernism?" It'd be this. Um, the the main feature I would think of would be like self-actualization as like the main goal, the highest goal of people. And the way that they do that is now, you know, previously it'd be in the more traditional cultures, it would have been based on maybe God or family, but like, you know, depending on where your culture is from, the, the emphasis is going to be like, you know, on, you know, devotion to the church or, you know, family hierarchy structure. Like there's these other ways that people have historically engaged um their lives in terms of thinking of duty and things like that but now in this age it's way more individual and this idea of you're free to pursue whatever you want and do that and there's really no rules around that you should probably add in more thoughts there but <laughs> yeah yeah is, yeah i could add more like the kind of central theme well the the first obvious thing to say is that like post is after right and the yeah. modern there is modernity so you kind of have to define uh what modernity is and people have kind of different markers they use some people go to rene descartes 
who had these meditations, you know, the cogito ergo sum in Latin, I think, therefore, I am. I'm sure people are familiar with that phrase, was his proofs of whether or not he should delve into this deep skepticism of reality, of whether or not the sun would rise up. Um, uh, and he ended up saying, no, that he should believe in God, but he kind of laid the foundations upon it, upon his self, which gets to that self-actualization, which could almost blend in with existentialism as well. And and you bring that modernity through the Renaissance, through the Enlightenment, through people like Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson and other deists who wanted to make their own versions of the Bible where they rip out all the miracles, you know, that's missing quite a few pages. Uh, but they still wanted to have like some attachment to Christianity, to people like the um, American transcendentalists, which I read in high school. I don't know if everyone did. People like Thoreau and Emerson, who were in the New England area, and and they represent the kind of what's called main main uh, mainline Protestantism, which ended up becoming the Unitarian Church and later uh, mel melded with the what's called the Universalist. So they became the Unitarian Universalist Church and. I would argue it's the kind of main ethos behind the Ivy League universities and thus through those Ivy League universities, all the kind of major universities that want to get even any grasp, like, you know, your wonderful Stanford, which is like the West Coast Ivy League, any grasp of the, um, the prestige. I mean, there's no way in which Stanford has any like starkly different views in the humanities, uh, in, in, in relation to thoughts of God than the, than the Ivy leagues of the East coast and certainly not like lesser prestigious universities. There's a few places like Hillsdale and uh, a few other private Christian, uh, or otherwise conservative colleges, which reject federal funding that, that try to get out of that prestige orbit. But, uh, really they're, you know, they're not looked at as like the place you want to go. You're not like, oh yeah, my, my, you know, sorry if anyone went there, but oh yeah, my kid went to Hillsdale is not as great as, oh yeah, my kid went to Stanford. Oh yeah, my kid went to Yale and Harvard. And, and uh, for example, uh, my sister went to Dartmouth and at the graduation ceremony, I found it funny. They still snuck a prayer in and even she was surprised at the time. Yeah. But the reason is because they have this background in, in a type of Protestantism, which became deism, which became like, postmodernism it became kind of nothing but for whatever reason the only time in her four years of being a student there that they ever did a prayer was at the graduation ceremony because somehow it was like still within the uh the structure but the idea is after modernity after this deism after this enlightenment post-modernity kind of says there are no categories um there are no definitions we need to undefine and redefine everything according to our our own ideas of what that are and that relates to uh race but more more and more it seems like every day right uh i don't know if you had a chance to see it was free for a couple days on twitter the what is a woman film by by matt walsh like sexuality gender all of these things they use words like problematic deconstruct demystify if you ever heard these words, yeah. uh, everything is about taking apart that which was before, that which was Lindy, that which was tradition. It's a totally change-oriented uh, religion. I would call it a religion, a change-oriented religion where everything in the past is tossed and you kind of rework it. You reconstruct everything yourself according to whatever you want. And yeah, that's obviously incompatible with <laughs> yeah. the basic views of uh Christian. so so do you remember at all what he wanted to supplant that with so he obviously is not a postmodernist. so what did he want yeah. to His, supplant that with the i think one thing that tim keller recognized um is that different people need to be reached differently and in his context he he's pioneered a church in new york city um wow. and uh so his church was comprised of you know the i mean however you describe new york in relation to america right like the a lot of i guess you know more wealthy more intellectual more in, in terms of meaning like high educated whatever there's that whole like elite 
uh, culture, he had a lot of exposure to, of course, along with all the people who don't fit in those categories who would also live in New York and come to his church. But he thought a lot about, well, how how is Christ relevant to people who are in this postmodern culture because they came out of some of these schools and all of that, right? Um, and to me, my, my biggest takeaway from that class was everything in the Bible is about Christ. He is the absolute foundation for everything. And he is still like true. And therefore, like our definitions, everything has to center around him. And just over and over consistently throughout scripture, like how does Christ answer the questions that postmodernism is failing to answer? How does Christ allow us to better understand the world? Like one, one really good example I remember, and I think this was from his class. I, I, it could be from another sermon and I could be um, throwing something in there, but he goes, one of the issues he sees with postmodernism is that it's inconsistent, right? So right now in New York, uh, you could have uh, a person. So imagine a person in New York and a person in the Middle East. Both of them um, are, let's, for this uh, argument, just make them males. And how is masculinity expressed in those cultures, right? Um, just using a traditional culture in this example. It doesn't have to be the Middle East. It could be anywhere. I think he used that, though. Um, and so right now in New York City, uh, masculinity is not expressed in terms of, you know, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to like, you know, it's like not necessarily physical and brawling, right? Um, if someone disrespects you, the answer is not going to be, I'm going to punch them in the face and like reclaim my honor or something like that. Um, and he goes, if someone in that culture is struggling, right, with something that's going on and they feel disrespected, that is not an a, a way that they're allowed to express their dissatisfaction. The culture would look down on getting in a fight and, you know, doing all this other stuff. Um, but on this other uh, context, that might be okay. Like if someone does something that's considered disrespectful or harmful, I'm, I'm really messing up this thing. I really, I'm messing up this analogy and I, I don't want to put words in Tim Keller's mouth now. <laughs> Let me sort of take that back. Um, Basically, in this class, one of the things he talks about is like, how can we be people who understand the culture well enough to be able to share how Christ is relevant to that and how he answers that an, an issue better? Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example. I'm completely blanking right now on the on the spot, but um, it was brilliant was phenomenal for me. And as I started teaching um, the youth group after I graduated and um, started serving in my church, it really made it important to me to always try to get back to Jesus Christ. Like this, this, this is what the word is about. Um, and he can meet the questions of our heart. He can meet the issues in our culture and he can address these things better than any cultural answer we have, whether it's postmodernism or traditional or whatever, like anything without Christ at the center of it is going to be missing something. Um, and it was great. I, I have an idea. This sounds like something that I've pushed for as well. Um, going back to uh, our father Thomas in Los Angeles, he would always say to kind of preach Christ everywhere. And he would say like physically, spiritually, mentally, and I added one day digitally. And at first he kind of rejected it, but he came back to me like a week or two later. He's like, you're right. We do have to do it digitally. And um, I started telling kids that, and they thought it was funny when I was saying it a couple of years ago, maybe less funny now, but you see, for example, um, aversions to new technology. They're always common. You know, if you go back and look at what people said about the radio and the television, when they were introduced, you'll, you'll crack up um, even about the internet. You know, but now, you know, the kind of uh, stereotype of the Zoomer is TikTok. The stereotype of the millennial like you and I is that 
we feel our intelligence is getting insulted and uh, our attention span is shortening when we're on TikTok. But the Zoomer is the TikTok specialist. So I'd say, you know, um, find a way to worship Christ in TikTok. I took it further. I had a group of kids in DC I was teaching, I'm still teaching them uh, and there's sa on Saturdays on Zoom. And um, between breaks, they would usually talk about how they're in Minecraft and everywhere. So I don't know if you know, it's been recently converted to a mosque, but there's a famous church called Agia Sophia, which is the Church of Holy Wisdom in what is now Istanbul, what used to be Constantinople. And of course, for centuries, it was one of the most famous churches on earth. Um, and they kind of let it stand for a while, but recently they kind of turned it into a museum and a mosque. Um, but of course it has a long history and something interesting that someone did on Minecraft one time is they built the Hagia Sophia church in Minecraft. And you could look it up um, in Google or DuckDuckGo, your favorite search engine of choice. And you can see the time that they spent to create this structure that then would be shared with others that on a just purely aesthetic level, even if you're not Christian, you could appreciate. And then if you're Christian, you could appreciate it even more as a kind of worship center for God that is that has this history and this context. And so I told the kids you could worship God on Minecraft. And I saw their minds getting blown because they never thought of that. They thought of Minecraft just as this outlet game that they could use. And I said, look, this is one example. I'm not telling you to go just mimic that. Like that's where your creativity comes in is that you need to come and figure out how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think on the first time that you had your appearance on um, my program here, the philosophy of art and science, we talked about to this day, that stunning ministry you had serving pancakes when people are out clubbing and, and going to parties, you know, uh, you can be modest and humble about it if you want. But like to this day, I think the idea of presenting unrequited love to them in the form of pancakes, not asking for a donation, not asking for money, but if any of them are open to hearing about Jesus, you would take the moment. But if not, um, if not, you know, you'd give them just pancakes. Um, by the way, I'll tell you, like, historically, very antithetical to the way, uh, you know, certain Pentecostal groups were preaching to the Orthodox in Ethiopia. Yeah. You know, some of them would kind of like jump them outside of the, uh, wait for them to come out of service and then tell them that, like, they don't know who Jesus Christ is. And let me tell you uh, who he is. So sometimes uh, there's a famous story tactic. I don't know if I told this to you before of like a guy outside of an Orthodox church and he's just like waiting for the believers to come out. And as soon as they come out, they say, you know, yes, was getan. Oh, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And one day, you know, a bad Orthodox, uh, he, he loses his temper and he takes uh, his shoe and he throws it at the guy and he says, when did I say that Jesus was a listero or a shoe shine? You know, <laughs> and like that's what I've been. I just come out of worshiping. Yeah. Yeah, but your approach, very, very different. It wasn't anti anything. It was pro whatever it is that you kind of believe in. Were, was there was there anything that you changed about your ministry in response to this seminary that you felt like now, okay, you're getting older. You're almost as old as me, Yossi. Uh, uh, is there something that you learned that helped you connect with the culture of the, of the youth at your parish? Yeah. I mean, I think the, one of the things that I learned and took away was like, don't be shy about talking about the, hot button issues of the day from a crystal centric perspective right um it's not my job to tell people what to think um but i believe that if if i believe this is something that the bible teaches and i believe that this will help somebody or help myself follow the lord better it's my responsibility to share that and i would want someone to share that with me and so you know, there's all these hot button issues, right, of the day. Like I remember eight, <laughs> two weeks ago, may, maybe three now, uh, I, I, I shared with the youth and uh, we were talking about fasting. And uh, there was a discussion in the group, you know, is fasting only food and water or slash and or water? Like is, you know, or can we fast all these other things as well that might be, uh, you know, that we really want? And we have this whole discussion and I was like, okay, well, what does the Bible say? Right? Like, what do we see in the Bible is what counts as fasting? And um, with 
also the asterisk of like, but what whatever we decide or whatever we, decision we come to doesn't mean that whatever we decide to not do is bad. We can choose to abstain from X. Let's say fasting is only food, right? You can abstain from whatever you want and it not technically be fasting, but if it's helping you follow the Lord, abstain and do that thing, right? Like do what you need to do. But I just from my reading of scripture believe like if it's fasting, we see people abstaining from food. Um, I'm not going to die on this hill, but people are abstaining from food in scripture, sometimes also water. Um, and, you know, like the Nazarite vow, they might abstain from wine or cutting their hair and these other things. But to me, in my understanding, that's not fasting specifically. Now, we were going back and forth and they were having this discussion. And so some kids were like, yeah, no, you can fast uh, other things. And other people were like, no. And then just... I was like, uh, okay, I'm going to say something uh, sort of like, like I, I forgot the word I used, but I was like, it's going to be shocking. And I I, I don't want, I, there's going to be some shock value, but really think about what I'm saying. If the idea here is like, you know, people are talking about, yeah, I can fast my phone because I use it all the time and it's uh, distracting and I can give that time to God. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like abstain from that if you need to. But uh, if someone's addicted to porn, can they fast porn? And they were like, oh, I guess not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so anyways, the takeaway from that was I think Tim Keller did a really good job of not shying away from issues that were in the cultural consciousness, right? If we're going to, if, if there's conversation around homosexuality, what, what does that mean? What does the Bible say about this? How do we engage in a culture that um, has a lot of hurt from the church, as well as people who might disagree with the church's stance. Like, how, how do you do these things? Um, how do you talk about being a believer, but not necessarily tied to a political party? Like, because we've seen people do this or that. And like, how do we engage in all these, these different ways? Right. And I love that. And that's something I've tried to take into my group and we talk about all those things. It's just like, hey, look, you read the word and come to a conclusion yourself. It's don't just listen to me. I don't want you to listen to me. Like, I want you to listen to what you believe that God is leading you to do. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I love that you said fasting. The Orthodox Church is actually in a fasting period now that they call Somahawariat or the fast of the apostles. And so it's a time for us to remember them more. Yes. Uh, a lot of people like to dismiss it and they'll call it either Yesene's Om, which is the month, or Yekes, which is called. <laughs> the fast of the priests because they want to separate yeah. the clergy from the faithful um one of my favorite fasting passages is from uh isaiah 58 so i hope you don't mind as i uh reading scripture absolutely yeah. by all means <laughs> more valuable than anything i have to say <laughs> uh isaiah 58 cry aloud spare not lift up your voice like a trumpet tell my people their transgression and the house of jacob their sins Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fists of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning, and your healing shall spring forth speedily, 
and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. It goes on, but I'll stop there and invite everyone else to read the rest of Isaiah 58. That was just verses one to nine. Um, this, um, this is where I, you know, I kind of stand on with you. Fasting in the strict sense means food and drink, but I think it could be extended to, um, I think this term is abused, but social justice, right? Like giving to the poor, giving to the needy, taking care of. I think that's a constant theme, especially in in the prophets. It's why we usually in our church, um, we combine the three things, the fasting and prayer. I, there are even some manuscripts that differ in the New Testament about like a, a certain kind of demon can only be taken out with prayer. And then some manuscripts say with prayer and fasting. And so we usually um, not just couple, but triple so fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, we usually, uh, or giving to the needy and to the poor, uh, also called acts of mercy. We usually, um, uh, I want to say pair, but triple those things uh, together. Mm -hmm. And actually, this reminds me of something else. The kind of, uh, it's very important to know the cultural context, like you said. And it's interesting when you take the Bible straightforwardly uh, and you contra make that in contradistinction to whatever the world is teaching at the time, you're going to come off as like conservative, whether it's capital C or lowercase C, you know, whether a Republican, you know, or Democrat, like you're going to come off as a certain, like you said, political perspective or, or at least like disposition of conservative. Um, from again, what little I've read of Timothy Keller, I, I have heard that he's kind of been critiqued from both sides in that way. And going back to our, our polarities of thinking and experience or the caricatures of the intellect and emotions, you, you see, I think a little bit, again, it's each individual is different, but I think you see a general uh, disposition or trend of liberality and uh, conservativeness. Like I think of someone like Justin Bieber being affiliated with the Hillsong people and being affiliated with the charismatic side. Obviously, there are conservative charismatics, but uh, I, I think it's also gendered to kind of a women-men thing. I think in those uh, Tim Keller spaces, if I'm not mistaken, at least the Calvinist spaces I've seen, it seems... Um, women. I, I wonder if... Um, if if people have tried to pin you down or pin him down and this balance of like having the correct doctrine but also like remembering to take care of the needy and and the poor like being at a soup kitchen but also like making sure that your doctrine is right like do, do you ever get does, does anyone try to pin you into one or the other i have heard that he was good at blending those things whereas I, it seems I, some people are are easier to put in one box or the other I, I'm sure people have their thoughts on whatever they see from me, but I, I think one thing that Tim Keller, I think made a really good point about throughout his time was Jesus didn't fall into your political category. Like there's going to be issues that Jesus spoke on that are going to be priorities for one political party and other issues you spoke of that are going to be priorities for another political party. Our job is not to try to make everybody happy or fit in neatly or worry about, like, we just need to be faithful to what Jesus has said. And Jesus himself, like, <laughs> got flack from everybody, you know, the, the pagans, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, like it, you see all of these different ways that what Jesus said was subversive to people's worldviews. At the same time, he did it in love. And like people from all those classes of people loved him and followed him. And people from all those classes didn't. And like, we should not expect any different. Um, and so I, I think Tim Keller really try to not be um associated with just one or the other because he's like look i'm just trying to do what jesus is i believe jesus is saying and we're not always going to agree and there's going to be some things about his theology that i'm sure he's going to find out he wasn't right about 
and things that he was right, you know? So we shouldn't hold on. We should always hold our positions with humility, right? Um, and it, yeah, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, I think it was to the Pharisees, scribes of the law, I believe, like you search the scriptures daily for in them you believe you have eternal life, but you're missing me. That's a danger to all of us, right? We can be so hung up on things that we believe are doctrine and true and all of that and miss Jesus. And then, of course, on the other side, right? Like Jesus <laughs> said, um, you have heard, you know, do not commit adultery. I say, <laughs> don't even lust after a woman in your heart. That's the same thing. Like Jesus' standard doesn't make anybody comfortable. Like none of us are going to come away thinking, oh man, like I'm good. Like, and so that should also come out in how we relate to others. I think like we shouldn't um, be too closely tied to any specific thing. Um, that's good. Yeah, that's church. good. Um, another thing you told me is that you had been moved by, uh, I think, a preaching or a teaching he had on the gospel of Luke chapter oh, 15, man. which has oh, the three... Man. Three parables, oh, one on lost sheep, one on lost coin, one on lost son, also known as the prodigal son. And my yeah. Bible teacher even likes emphasizing, calling it the parable of the merciful father. But yeah. which, which, was it the whole chapter or one of these three Dude, parables? It was a seven-part sermon series called Prodigal God. Changed my life. Um, and yeah, I would say the th like three most influential things that Tim Keller has been a part of were they at yeah, that for me. That, that class, this sermon series, and the book, Meaning of Marriage, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that too. But this sermon series, of Prodigal God, I grew up and even through college, like sort of was like this whole love of God thing. It's like, yes, God loves us. That's so important. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Crucial key, okay, let's move on, was like my thought process of like, love is great. Okay, cool. But the love of God is like foundational to everything. And that sermon series opened my eyes to the depths of the love of God. And that changed me. Like it's, I think a lot of people believe like, man, they have a, they, people who are not believers and might have objections to Christianity, I think one common objection might be, but like, I'll have to give up X, Y, and Z. And it's just not going to be worth it. Like, I want to be able to do these things. And I think that's focusing on the wrong part of it. Like, you get to be with God. And he is so good that there's nothing too costly that we could give up for him. Um, like the, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went into a field, found a buried treasure, sold all he had to buy that field and did it joyfully. Um, you can give up your money, your time, your career, your everything, and you will find on the other side, it's absolutely worth it. And so this sermon series really opened my eyes to that. Like that we have a God in heaven who loves us so much that he would leave 99 good listening sheep, whatever, to go find the one that wandered off. And then I'm like, you know, okay, cool. Like, I guess I wander sometimes, but I'm a better sheep than most. So uh, maybe not that <laughs> relevant to me. Um, and then goes on to uh, the lost coin. And I'm like, yeah, once again, I don't really get lost, whatever. And then he spent time on the, the, like you said, the prodigal son slash merciful father, and he called it prodigal God. So found out the word prodigal just means like lavishly spending, right? Um, and we a lot of times focus on the son lavishly spent and, you know, wasted his father's resources. And squalor. Yeah. And we miss that the absolutely unbelievable extravagant love that the father lavished on his son is the point of the story mm -hmm. like from the a lot of people want to read calf. that yeah a lot it's easy to read that story and think ah i shouldn't waste things and i should be 
um, faithful and not walk away. Sure, yes. But the elder son did those things. And he's part of this story too. And he's not painted in a good light. Hopefully he ended up coming in. We don't know, right? But that's what got me. Is when he started talking about the elder brother, I was like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, that's me. Um, the younger son did his own thing. He's like, this is what I want. I'm going to... In that culture, to say something like that to your father is just unbelievable. To say, give me my inheritance. He's essentially saying to his father, I don't care if you live or die. Just give me my money that I'm going to get when you die and I'm out of here. And the father loves him enough to give it to him. He goes, he comes back. And the son finally realizing after all that he had done, servants are treated better in my, my father's house. I'm going to come home and ask to be a servant. He still doesn't understand how much his father loves him. He's practicing his speech. He comes home and he goes, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. And the dad is, runs out to meet him, showers him with love, restores him by putting the ring on his finger and giving him the uh, sandals for his feet, robe, kills the fat calf like you said, right? And he's restored his son, not as a servant, but into his sonhood again. He loves his son. He's so excited that his son is home with him. And the elder brother, comes home and sees this party and is upset the father comes out to talk to the elder brother and the elder brother says i have slaved away for you all these years and you've never given me a goat <laughs> and i was like man if that's not my perspective sometimes you know i'm so faithful i go to church i do all these things god like how come I don't have this or what about this and all, all of that? And the dad is like, son, everything I have is yours. You are with me always. Like he loves him. He cares for him. And he invites him, you know, come enter in. And Tim Keller brought out for me, this is the first time I'd heard it. It's like this elder brother also doesn't understand his father's love. He's living in, a, he's working out of, he's being obedient and doing these, all of these things out of a sense of work-based righteousness. He's like, I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to be a good son and I'm going to earn X, Y, and Z. And so he's devastated when he sees prodigal son coming home because he's like, wait, he did everything he wasn't supposed to? Wait, you mean I could have just not done any of this? Like, even the elder son does not care and understand his father's love. And then Tim Keller, because everything is always about Jesus, says, you see, there's someone who went out looking in each of these three stories in Luke 15. And the first one, someone goes out, the shepherd goes out and finds the lost sheep. The woman goes out and finds her lost coin. Who searched in this parable? The search person is missing. He goes, it should have been the elder son. The elder son should have seen his father and said, man, I, I can't bear to see my father distraught and upset. Like I can go find my brother. I'm going to go look for my brother and bring him back home. But the brother didn't do that. He goes, but we have an elder brother, Jesus, who saw his father and said, my, my father desires that all people would be saved. And he came and he lived a life that was sinless and perfect. He died on a cross, a death he did not deserve to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And I was like, woo, like, woo, what a good God we serve. Like, he is so worth everything, like everything. So, yeah, that sermon series wrecked me. I, yeah. yeah, no, it's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's very stunning for us to dwell on the depths of his love and the depths of his mercy. And it's something that we could spend our the rest of our lives um, uh, thinking about reflecting. My own Bible teacher had a similar time, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, where he blew my mind in that same passage where he kind of showed me that the elder brother was Israel and the younger brother were the Gentiles. And there was the envy and jealousy of the salvation delivered to Israel that they did not want to share with the Gentiles. And there, yeah, that there's so many, yes. uh, <laughs> that's a tough passage, man. It's something that we always got to go back to. And so again, 
Uh, we invited you to read Isaiah 58. We'll also invite you to read now Luke chapter uh, 15 mm -hmm. uh, in memory of Tim Keller. The other thing is that now this, this God who is so loving and so bountiful in his mercy has blessed you with a wonderful wife and, and children and a marriage. And you, uh, you read this book at the beginning of your marriage or before you got into marriage. Before. So talk to before. us about, is it the meaning of marriage? You said the meaning of marriage by Tim Keller and Kathy. Um, I think, yeah, they co-wrote. Oh, he co-wrote it with his wife. Yeah. I, I think she at least wrote one chapter. I, yeah. I can't remember if her name is on the front, but yes, she definitely was part of that. Um, and he gives her a lot of credit throughout the book of like, you know, this is important. Um, and we learned a lot of this together. Um, so a quick sort of synopsis about my sort of thoughts about marriage growing up was I didn't really feel like it was that important. Um, <laughs> got to college and... Um, a really good buddy of mine was very much about singleness. And I was like, wait, the most influential people in the Bible were Jesus, single, Paul, single. John the Baptist. Wait, I mean, if you really love the Lord, like. And so I was, I was in that camp for a while. And um, a couple of things happened on this journey, but the Tim Keller portion was I uh, was recommend that book. Um at like I think I read it when I was in grad school, where at that point I'd sort of been wrestling a little bit with like, okay, well, maybe I'm not going to be single forever. Um, maybe I am open to the idea of being married one day. Like, um, that's what so funny because you got you got married relatively young for our generation. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's what's funny that you you thought, oh, I might be single forever. Meanwhile, you probably beat. I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't know your whole friend group, but I imagine you were one of the first of your friends to be married. No, a lot of people beat you. So I was. I my my one of my best friends got married summer after sophomore year in college. Wow. So before junior year. So I was in his wedding. That was the second wedding I'd been in in college. Then graduation happened. One of my other really close friends gets married. Boom. I think at that point I'm like third or fourth that like that summer. Basically, I think by the time I read this book, I'd been in five weddings. Wow. I was That's like, funny. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. funny. Okay. If yeah. not your generation of friends, it must have been a sure. unique group. Just my, my, Maybe my our family group. and the generation writ large. Yes, absolutely true. It's just, but. At some point, my parents were like, wait, what's wrong with you? Why is it? Why are you always in the wedding? Why are you not the one? <laughs> so I was like, chill, mom. Um, when are you going to get chose? Exactly. But this book, um, when I was sort of thinking, okay, well, like, if I were to get married, like, what what would a, a good godly relationship look like? And a friend recommended it to me. And this book lays out a vision for what a godly marriage can be and man i was like if i can find that absolutely i will get married like i by the if 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 god will be gracious enough to give me that i will receive that and i think you know he he talks throughout the book you know starts with the foundation of like okay well what is marriage is it just signing a piece of paper well no we we see marriage instituted all the way back in uh genesis and how this is something created by God. And now it's, you know, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, you know, this is the here to show us and illuminate the mystery of Christ in the church. And he gives all the, you know, the theological background for it. And, you know, this is a, a sacred thing. But then what does it look like to pursue marriage with someone? And one of my big takeaways from that book was, he, he goes, you know, in all my years of being married now and counseling other uh, people as a pastor and other married couples and in, in marriage ministry and stuff, I realized most people are not looking for the right thing. Most people are looking for someone who's physically attractive to them mm -hmm. and hopefully that person also checks off these other boxes of like, you know, they're Christian, they're doing this, like these other things that are important to them. And he goes, you know, if all this is true about script, that scripture says about marriage, like what should our priorities be and what we look for? Of course, physical 
appearance and like being attracted to someone is important. Like definitely don't ignore that. But he goes, most people I come across have this like flaw omatic meter. Like, oh, I went on a date with so-and-so, but like they're dirty, the elbows were dirty. Uh, like this com coming up with all of these things that are like not relevant or important in the light of like what marriage is meant to be and signify. And he and he, he details his own uh, story where he was friends with Kathy, his his now wife, um, and they enjoyed spending time together. They read a lot of books, but they were just it was platonic friends. Like he, I think when they met, he was in a relationship with someone else, and uh, eventually, like Kathy was like, "Yo, uh, you need to make a decision here because it, it, I I feel like." we're dating but we're not and he, he goes on to talk about how like he confronted him and his eyes were open to like wait what what would i want in a wife that i like that kathy doesn't have like she loves the lord they were in seminary together all of these things he's like oh sort of opened his eyes and he's now the story is you know they got married they have kids they're starting churches together all that um but if my the goal in my life is to glorify god and I want to honor the Lord, what should I look for in a wife? What are the things that should be important? And more importantly, what kind of person should I be to be a godly husband, right? To be a person that someone that I would want to marry in light of all of this, and they would want to marry me. Um, and it was great. I just, it gave me a vision for like a godly marriage can make such an impact and it can touch people and we can show the world how much christ loves the church through this and we can be per persuasive and like god is good like we can tell a good story with our marriages and i loved that um and by the grace of god i met debbie a couple years later and uh it was platonic for a while <laughs> it just happened to like she didn't come from me or anything like that um but it, I had my own little struggle because like she was a student at the time. I'd already graduated. Uh, I'd moved back to Austin. She was a student at UT. And my roommate at the time, uh, shout out Christian, uh, was like, yo, you ever thought about dating Debbie? We'd known each other for about a year at this point. She was his friend. And like, he was the mutual friend for us. And he was saying the same thing to her. Like, hey, have you ever thought about dating uh, Yossi? And I was like, uh, oh, nah, she's a student, man. Like what I look like out here. Hey, let's go out. Let's spend time together. She's got out to study for finals. And she always has the caveat. If she was sitting right here, she'd say, but I never said that. And so, um, that was your, your perception of exactly. why you wouldn't, our relationships, your you reason left. for not your non-biblical reason, which yeah. by the way, very similar to me, yeah. of your non-biblical reason for not wanting to date someone of a certain age is uh that you thought this the studies or something would get in the way i myself had it in in my head like a limit of like 25 or something for like a minute like a floor of what i was looking for and my wife at the time when we were not uh yet husband and wife was 23 and just had turned 23. yeah yeah and um yeah so using the bible to weed away our are random reasons. I still have friends, by the way, who have like all the reasons in their head for why they set, you know, their uh, their Tinder or whatever uh, dating app profile to a certain age range. And I, so I hope they're listening to you right now. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, it's literally what you said. Like, I really had one of those moments, and I was like, I have this opinion that is not grounded in scripture. Okay, is that? something i'm allowed to think sure should i think it and i was praying i was like god like is 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 this something i should be open to and i just remember the impression of like are you going to trust me with your relationship future or are you gonna hold everything in your hands and i was like well when you put it like that like i i want to be somebody who says god you can do whatever you want um and i'm so glad that i did <laughs> and so after that, I was like, okay, I'm open to this. Um, I'm gonna try to ask her out. You know, uh, I had to find ways to meet up and then eventually uh, asked her out and uh, she said, okay. 
praise God. And then we went on a few more dates. And, you know, at, at this point, I'd, I'd known her for a little bit. And so I knew she was godly, loved the Lord. Um, and that the things that were important to me in our faith were important to her. Like she also wanted to glorify and honor God and would want to be in a relationship that honored the Lord. And so, yeah, we started dating, got engaged, got married. And we've been now happily married for since March 2020. March 2020. Now we have two, uh, twin boys, Mennon and Melchizedek. Uh, they were born in March 22, 2022. Yeah. Uh, glory to God. So you, you've gotten then to apply the meaning of marriage into, yeah. into your life. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it was these three things, this course on postmodernism, this, um, this exposition of Luke chapter 15, and then his, his book, The Meaning of Marriage. That's how you got to know Tim Keller. And I think that's a, yeah. A great formula for people to get started and they could branch out in any other way or they could you know focus on one of those things if if they wanted to remember who he was yeah is there anything else that that we have left out either about tim keller or any special message you want to uh give to my my audience out there uh i mean i i just like tim keller bless dr tim keller bless so many people and i it it is an admirable and godly goal to live our lives in a faithful way and represent him before others. And so regardless of what people might think about some of his stances, I mean, that, you know, people are free to agree or disagree with anything, whether you're a believer or not. Obviously, if you're not a believer, you probably disagree with a lot more of his stuff. But uh, it is a great thing that he did to devote his life to honoring the Lord and doing what he could to be faithful. And I hope to do that. I, I hope to be somebody who is that intentional and will be so devoted to doing that. So that's amazing. You know, condolences to his family. May God comfort them in this time. Um, you know, passed away a couple of weeks ago now, but um, I, I thought it was amazing. I was reading some of the stuff uh, he said right before and he 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 suffered from cancer but he'd beaten it before and this time around you know towards the end of his life i think he was getting weaker and he could sort of see it coming and he just said i'm ready to see jesus you know it's it's time you know let me go and he got to say his goodbyes and what a what a beautiful thing like may we all be able to run our race finish it and get to the end and say i'm ready to see the lord like yeah. I mean, uh, let him definitely uh, guide you to be on a similar path. Thank you for being on the program again, Eosias. Cool. Thank you for having me.